Welcome to Avalon Church and welcome to uh, Football Sunday here at Avalon. We're so glad that you're here. Those of you that are here in the room, thank you for being here. Those of you that are joining us online, thank you for joining our community. There are people all over the state, all over our region, all over the nation, and literally all over the world that are joining us uh, online. And we are very, very thankful for your participating in our online community today. Well, we are having the theme today of unshaken. And we certainly have a time that seems a little shaky. Would you agree with that? We've been in kind of a little bit of a shaky time uh, in the last almost year. Uh, the truth is, uh, in our politics, it's been shaky. But hey, what's different? I mean, that's always the case, right? And uh, in my opinion, at least. And so, uh, so if you're trusting in politics, that's going to be shaky ground. If you're trusting in the economy, that can be shaky ground. If you're trusting in your job or money, that can be taken away. And it's surprising how quickly it can be taken away. And that's shaky. Even if you're trusting in your own health or your own strength or your own ability, it can be taken away just like that. But thank God we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is unshakable and our faith in Him can be unshaken when we trust in Him. And that's what we want to talk about today to help all of us get our eyes on Jesus and be able to have an unshakable faith. Well, the story I'm going to share with you today is a pretty familiar one. Uh, it is, in fact, one that many of you is your favorite miracle of Jesus because it's when he turned water to wine and you like to drink wine, so you like to read that story. So today we're going we're gonna, to uh, read this story and understand a little bit about culturally what was happening during that time. During that time, uh, a wedding feast would normally last about a week. And it was the groom's responsibility uh, to make sure that there was wine for the wedding feast. Now, there are two things that the groom had to do. He had to have sufficient quality in the wine, and he had to have sufficient quantity to last to serve everyone else. If he did not do that, it was more than just a little social faux pas. It literally would follow them the rest of their lives. It was something that was inexcusable in that culture in that day. It was something that would be bothersome for the rest of their lives. And so we're going to pick up this story about how Jesus' mother and Jesus was invited uh, to this wedding. And uh, we're going to find out what Jesus actually did there at the wedding that uh, I believe will help us to see that when we put our faith in him, it will be unshakable because of the love of God. So begin with me in John chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, And on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And I'll add this bit of commentary. Most likely that was a relative of hers because she was invited to the wedding and it seemed like she was kind of helping. And you know how it is uh, if you have a wedding and the mother and the cousins and the aunts and everybody wants to be involved. And so that was what Jesus' mother was doing. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, I want you to think about this as a metaphor for life. The wine of this life will run out. It doesn't matter how good your wine is. It doesn't matter how good your life is. The wine of this life, if this is what you're trusting in, if this is what you're putting your faith in, the wine of this life will run out. It'll eventually run out in your marriage. It'll eventually run out with your health. It'll eventually run out uh, with your job. The wine of this life will run out. When the wine ran out and the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, he was not being disrespectful. It was just a way of speaking and letting his mother know. It, it, was, it was really a term of respect. But he was letting her know that he was beginning his ministry, that he was now entering into a different phase of his life. What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do what he tells you to do. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now let me just split that in two. Let's say that it held 25 gallons each. That would equal 
750 bottles of wine. The, the amount of water would equal 700 and 50 bottles of wine, not just 750 bottles of wine, but 750 bottles of fine wine. If you took and bought a bottle of fine wine today and you bought 750 bottles of it, it's probably gonna cost you somewhere between 250,000 and $400,000. Not a bad gift for a wedding, would you imagine? And not only that, it was 4,500 glasses of wine that Jesus made. What does that tell us? tells us Jesus is always more than enough. And they filled them to the rim, and Jesus said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. He was just simply saying, they get a little tipsy and they're not gonna be able to taste the difference in the old bad wine. Everybody serves the good wine first. You've held the best till last, but you have kept the good wine until now. And this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Notice what Jesus did there. He manifested his glory. In other words, he showed that he was God. And his disciples, because of his love, because of what he did, because of his power, they believed in him. Now today, if you're gonna have an unshakable faith, you have to do what the disciples did and see the glory of God. You have to recognize Jesus for who he is, that he is the son of God, that he is all powerful God, that he is in control of things even that you have no control over. Did you know that Jesus is in control even during a pandemic? Jesus is in control even if you've lost your job. Jesus is in control even if you've lost a loved one to COVID-19. I've lost cousins friends, family members to this dreadful disease. Some of you have too, or at least you know somebody who has. And yet, even during times that are difficult, that are confusing, where we have no answers, we can have an unshakable faith. We can have an unshakable faith in an almighty God that loves us. And I wanna just show you that there are a few things that Jesus established here that will help us have an unshakable faith. First of all, he established the fact that he was God and that he's gonna get glory and that he's concerned about us and that he loves us deeply. I can tell you this, no matter what you're facing in life, no matter what you're going through in life, God loves you. No matter how difficult your life may seem at this moment, God loves you and he's with you. And if you'll trust him, he will bless you and he'll take you through whatever you're going through, or at least he'll go through it with you. He doesn't always deliver us from all of our problems. Sometimes he delivers us through the problems, not from the problems. And he's always with us whenever we trust him. He is worthy of an unshakable faith. And I wanna just point out a few reasons from this passage why you can trust him implicitly. No matter what, no matter the storm, no matter the difficulty, you can have an unshakable faith in him. I think the first reason is that he is in control and he's sovereign. He showed this by turning water into wine. He shows that he has power even over the elements. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have power to turn water to wine. And I'm pretty sure you don't either. And here's what that tells me is that God Almighty, Jesus Christ is in control no matter what. He has the power. He's sovereign. And here's the thing about God being sovereign. When he is in control and he is sovereign, he is Lord, you can trust him. Oh, I may not understand everything. I may not even agree with everything, but he didn't really ask my opinion anyway. And the truth is you can trust him in him. Just like Jesus was able to take that water 
and turn it to wine. He has power over this world. He has power over your circumstances. He has power over your life. And you can have an unshakable faith in our God. I think the second reason that we see in this passage, you can trust him and have an unshakable faith is that he has power over all things. God has power even over a pandemic. Jesus has power even when we are powerless. You know, a lot of times in life, we are powerless. Some of you have felt abuse, the unfairness at your job, the unfairness of life. People have done wrong to you and you felt betrayed, belittled, afraid. And here's the thing. God has power over all things. He has power over every one of your circumstances and he has the power to take you through and to be with you and to walk with you and you can have an unshakable faith in him even when you're going through very difficult times. One of the beautiful things that I believe demonstrated in this passage shows us the power of God is one thing that Jesus did here with this young couple in this wedding is he removed the shame. Can you imagine the shame that this young couple was going through? They were so embarrassed. It was a social faux pas. They had failed. They had done wrong. I mean, not that they had sinned, but they had miscalculated. They had misjudged. They had messed up. And one of the beautiful things about coming to Jesus Christ as our Savior is this. He removes the shame. Did you know the Bible teaches us that when Jesus died on the cross, he took all of our sins on his body. He took all of our shame, all of our pain, even in Isaiah, and it's repeated in Matthew, uh, that Jesus, he bore our sins, but he also, with his stripes, we are healed. He bore our sicknesses, he bore our pain, he bore our shame. And the shame of your sin, the shame of your failure, the shame of your past, the, same, the shame of your misjudgments, the shame of your miscalculations, the shame of the failures in your life. When you turn to him, you know what Jesus does with his blood, with his righteousness, with his love? He removes the shame and he covers the sin and he blesses your life. With a God like that loving us, how can you not have an unshakable faith in him? In him, he removes the shame. Another thing Jesus does is he lets us know that he is more than enough. I just told you, approximately 750 bottles of wine. I don't know how big that wedding party was, but that's enough wine for a really, really, really big one or a really, really, really long uh, party, I'm telling you that. 4,500 glasses of wine. Now, I don't know if I've ever been to a wedding that had that much wine. Oh, I've been to small weddings where they drank too much wine, but I've never been to one like that. But you know what that tells me about Jesus? In the same way that Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed a crowd of 5,000 men, not including women and children, and when everyone ate to their satisfaction, everyone ate till they were filled, there were 12 baskets left over. You know what that tells me about our God? He's more than enough. You may feel like a failure. You may feel like you have fallen short. And I hate to say this, I don't mean to be unkind, but you have. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're trying to approach God on your righteousness, why would you do that? Do you know that most people believe that the way to go to heaven or to be made right with God is to keep the Ten Commandments? My goodness. How in the world can we possibly think that we would be enough? That our righteousness would be enough did you know that every one of us has broken every single commandment according to the Bible? You say, well, I've never murdered anybody. The Bible says if you've ever hated anybody, that's the same root cause, same root sin. You ever looked at someone and lusted after them? The Bible says that's the same root sin as adultery. Uh, you ever covet after someone's uh, car or job or bank account or whatever they had? Every single one of us We've dishonored our parents. We've stolen at least from God. 
Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, every single one of us has broken the Ten Commandments. Why, in the name of goodness, would I approach the author of perfection, the author of holiness, the very personification of good and love? Why would I tell him how good I am? Well, that's silly. Do you know why? Because I fall far, far short. No matter how good I am, I can't be good enough. Oh, you might be a good person compared to someone else. You probably are. And I'm pretty sure you can find somebody that you're better than. But you know what? That's not good enough. But thank God Jesus said that he came uh, to fulfill the law and he lived a life that we were supposed to live, that we could not live, and he died a death that we were supposed to die. Why? Because Jesus is more than enough. He's more than enough to cover your sin and to forgive you and to make you right with God. He's more than enough to cover your failure, the shame of your past, the shortcomings of your life. He's more than enough if you'll simply trust him and put your faith in the unshakable love of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a wonderful thing to know that we can put our faith in him. He's more than enough. And then the next thing I believe this shows us is that he supplies our lack. You know, I sure do lack a lot. I, I, I lack the goodness. I lack the consistency. I lack the faithfulness sometimes, but I'm so glad that our God, he is more than enough and he supplies our lack. Just like in this story, this young couple, they lacked. They didn't have enough. They were probably poor and couldn't afford and thank God, Jesus supplied the lack. And then he covers our mistakes. I'm so glad that he does that. I'm so glad that he does not bring up my past. The Bible tells us that when we turn to him and he forgives us, that he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. You know, you can take a globe and you can start going south. You can trace your finger all the way to the bottom of that globe. But when you get to the bottom and you keep on going around, you start going north. And it's south and then it's north, and then it's south, and then it's north. And it only goes about halfway around the globe. But when you start going east or, uh, and, and west, I think I'm going the right direction. You start going east, at, you know, you'll go east forever. You know, when you start going west, you'll go west forever. As far as infinity from infinity, so far has he removed our sins from us. The Bible says that he will remember our sins no more. Do you know that it's not because God's forgetful. He's not, but he chooses not to remember because he removes our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank God that he covers our mistakes. And then he removed the disgrace of this young couple. Do you know that Jesus will remove the disgrace from your life? If you'll trust him, he'll use what the devil meant for evil in your life and turn it for good. I've seen God take people that literally had murdered people and served time in prison and had literally spent or been sentenced to life in prison. And God miraculously allowed them to be released from prison and used that pain, that sin, the, the mistakes of their past. And today, the person I'm thinking about right now is a minister of the gospel in a church in the United States of America. And today, he is pointing people to Jesus. Why do I tell you that story? You know why? Because the very thing that the devil meant to destroy you, the very thing that the devil meant to ruin you, God will turn for good and he will use for his glory if you'll put your faith in the unshakable Jesus Christ. Oh man, I'm so happy for that. I'm so thankful that God, he will remove your disgrace. And then finally, he will reverse your failure. He'll reverse it. The very thing that defines you in your mind, God said, can say, no, 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 that's not what defines you. I, I, I'm, I'm shocked, to be honest, how our sinful nature thinks sometimes about how we're defined by our failures. We're defined by not a life of making right choices, but one bad choice. Don't we tend to do that to people? Don't we tend to do that to ourselves? We, we tend to put this in our, in our past, in our psyche, that we can never be this. We can never measure up because, well, I've just failed. Look at my past. Look at what I did. Look at how I ruined it. Look at how I blew it. But thank God, 
Jesus reverses our failures. I've shared this so many times with you that my own father, who was an alcoholic, the very thing that defined him about his life, that ruined his life, that was ruining his marriage, that was ruining his relationship with my mother and with me, is the very thing that God used to spur a testimony. When my dad got saved, God changed his life. And my dad eventually became a pastor and a missionary and a church planter. And today, he has had the greatest influence in my life for good. You know, he could have done like my grandpa. My grandpa Miller, Sanford Miller, he got saved about a a year before he died. He died at 50 years of age in his sleep. And I remember when he was, when I was young and we would go to his house and many times he would be drunk and he would just cry and we would make fun of him because he was a crying drunk. And you know, different people are different kinds of drunks. Some cry, some get angry and want to fight. Some get happy and some get a little too loving if you know what I'm talking about, okay? But my grandpa was a crying drunk and he would sit around and I, I think this probably is the cry of a lot of people. He'd get drunk and he'd say, I ain't so bad, am I? And he'd cry. He'd say, Roger, that's my dad. He'd say, Roger, I didn't do so bad, did I? And there's so many of us that because of our past, in our heart, we wouldn't say it out loud, but in our heart, we cry out, I'm not so bad, am I? I'm not so far away from God, am I? I'm not so far that God can't love me, am I? I'm not so far that God can't reach me, am I? And I've got good news for you. The answer is no. You're not too far. You've not done too much. You're not too far away. You're not too deep in the pit because God loves you. And through Jesus Christ, he sent Jesus to remove the sin, to forgive you your mistakes, to cover your disgrace and to bring you into a right relationship with the heavenly father. Amen, church. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. I've got some other things I could talk about, but I'm going to wrap this up. Here's the truth. You can have an unshakable faith. Something that only God can give you. Oh, I know we live in a pandemic. We live in confusing times. We live in broken times. But you know what? The world has always been broken since Adam and Eve. The world has always had sin since Adam and Eve. But thank God there is coming a day when Jesus is going to return. And Jesus is going to set everything right. And Jesus is going to return everything to its original order. And we're going to be able to see the glory. And you won't have to worry about who you vote for during that time. Because King Jesus is going to rule. And everything is going to be right. And he's going to set everything right in your life. But in the meantime, you got some things you got to deal with. You got a pandemic. You got sin. You got your own failures. You got things that you deal with at work. You got things in your family. You got things in your emotions. You got things in your health. And here's what I know Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough for all of us. And today, if you'll put your faith in him, he will give you an unshakable faith that no matter what you're going through, he will be right there with you and you'll know that you have someone that you can trust forever. Heavenly Father, help us to have an unshakable faith in you and in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love. Thank you for covering our shame. Thank you for forgiving our sin. Thank you for redeeming us and making us right with you. Thank you for justifying us and making it as if we had not ever sinned in our lives. Before I finish my prayer, I wanna ask those of you online that have been so faithfully watching. Would you trust Jesus today? Maybe you tuned in today, you don't even know why. Maybe you have been shaken during this time. I'm gonna ask you to put your faith in an unshakable love, an unshakable savior, Jesus Christ. You say, how do I do that, Richie? Well, it's very simple. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call 
upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and I realize that's very simple. And I don't, the gospel is not simplistic, but it's very simple. God says, if you'll ask, I'll save you. If you'll trust, I'll save you. If you'll put your faith in my finished work, not in your works, if you'll stop trusting yourself and ask me to save you, I will. You know, you don't have to have a degree in theology to be saved. All you gotta do is trust him. And I'm gonna ask you to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now the best I know how to change me, to come into my life, to redeem me, to save me, to forgive me. And I'm asking you to be my savior. And I'm asking you to give me an unshakable faith in you. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, if you want to pray that prayer, if you're going to pray that prayer, would you click right on your screen that you pray to receive Christ today? And for everyone in the room, the same thing. If you'll pray that prayer today, if you'll trust Jesus as your Savior today, please take the card out of the seat pocket in front of you and mark on there that you pray to receive Christ. Put your name and your contact information, and we'll contact you to help you take your next step. We're so happy for you and we're so proud for you for trusting Jesus as your Savior. Before I finish my prayer, how many would say, Pastor Richie, and we can't see those online, but I know that there are some that are following Christ today online and we need to rejoice in that. But those of you in the room that would say, Pastor Richie, today, this moment, today, while you were praying, while you were preaching, while you were praying uh, this prayer, I trusted Jesus as my Savior the best I know how, and I want you to know about it. I want you to slip up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. I see a hand there and there. Thank you for putting your hands up. Uh, just leave it up high enough and long enough for me to see it, okay? There are a couple of people in the room that prayed to receive Christ today. Let's give them a hand for trusting Christ today. And for those of you online that did the same thing today, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sufficiency of Christ. We thank you that you're more than enough. We thank you that we can put our faith in you, an unshakable faith that will take us through our storms. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.